Hello, YouTube. Welcome to Lucky 13 of Horizon Zero Dawn with a Therapist. I say this every time, but I'm so grateful that you are supporting this playthrough and that you've made it this far. I hope that you continue to enjoy the playthrough to whatever extent you're enjoying it. I would like to give a reminder to folks who are watching this that my analysis is not gospel. Uh, I don't claim to be right about anything that I'm saying, and it's many of the things that I analyze and pick up on are subjective in some way. Uh, I just offer a perspective on the things that are happening. So uh, I, I'm, I am in no way trying to make the claim that what I have to say is more important or smarter than what anybody else would have to say about this. But people seem to like what I have to say because I have a degree in human development and because I'm a therapist and all that fun stuff. And so that's what I try to offer. So... I just want to make sure that that's clear for folks that may not understand exactly why I'm doing this. I'm doing this to educate folks, to try to make things as translatable to everyday life as possible so that you might learn about something from your own life or think about the ways that you're approaching certain people or things that you are approaching in your own life. So sometimes that means I make some cognitive leaps, but that's just so that that's for illustrative purposes and for education. So. Uh, if I just sat and played the game, that would not be particularly fun. So I pause a lot. Deal with it. That said, leave a like. Leave a comment. Engage with the content. Tell people about it if it's been meaningful for you. It goes a really long way to helping with uh, with channel growth. And I really appreciate those of you that do that. So, All right. Let's see what Aaron's got. Maybe we're going to meet Sun King of Odd here at the beginning of the stream. Talk to Blameless Marad. Greetings, Aloy. I am known as Blameless Marad. Please come with me. You're needed for an important consultation. What do you mean? Where's Erend? He's inside, attending the Sun King, where we should be without further delay. Follow me, please. All of these people are here to see the Sun King. Yes, and each has come to ask a favor of him. Unpleasant, but that's politics. The Sun King is eager to meet you, the machine tamer with a curious eye for detail. It's all very intriguing. I'm not here to intrigue you. Too late. Man. All these people want an audience. So, oh man. I, I don't know how it is here in Meridian, but I would have to imagine, maybe, and we'll learn more, I'm sure, but I would have to imagine this runs similar to how basically any situation like this runs, where folks are approaching the king. Uh, it is often more of a placebo than anything else. It's this sense that you can actually go to somebody who can influence it, and maybe they'll help. And I traditionally, I think these types of things were used a lot more for optics rather than actual systemic change. I would hope that the Sun King is doing this because he legitimately wants to understand the issues of his constituents. And maybe he does because Avad sounds like he's a better dude than Jaron. But I get really skeptical of stuff like this because it's like, man, these people are doing everything they can to try to get their needs met. And... Uh, Maybe there's limited resources. The guy's right. It is politics. But I would hope that people... These are also... I would hope that these are not just people from the top level of Meridian. I would hope that you could actually get people from down below as well. Uh, where there are some real issues. Aside from my sword got stolen. And now Outlander from the sun. She's going to be by some Outlander woman. Honey, I've been here for two hours. And this Nora goes to the front. I am interested in the fact that Aloy is already sort of... Oppositional. Like children who whine when they don't get a second helping of dessert. All right, cool. I like that perspective. We're cool. What's the Sun King like? The most important thing is what he isn't like. His father. I think you'll find him to be a reasonable man. Aloy of the Nora. 
She who sees the unseen. Welcome. It would seem you have done me a great service. Erend, tell her what you found. I, I checked Ursa's tomb. You were right, Aloy. The body is missing a scar below her right knee. I gave it to Ursa when we were kids, fighting over a toy sword. If the body is not Ursa's, then we must assume she is still alive. And I will not abandon her. We only know she was taken, not who took her. I can help with that. Ursa has an enemy among the Oseron. A warlord named Durval. Impossible. Every clan in the claim has been hunting for him since the liberation. He has to be dead by now. No other Oseron had the motive and ingenuity to lure Ursa into this trap. I expect to find him lurking somewhere near the border. I've already sent an agent to investigate. He'll be waiting for word from us at the marketplace in Pitchcliffe. I can't move troops to the border without provoking the Oseron. But I could send a few vanguardsmen. And perhaps an exceptionally gifted Nora as well. Errant, Murad, let me discuss it with her privately. So, two things I want to point out. One is just kind of a floating thought that I don't know has too much depth yet, but... Erend did the thing that Erend tends to do in these moments when he is presented with information that he doesn't like or doesn't synthesize very well. Which is for him to immediately go, Impossible! <laughs> it couldn't be! We've seen him do this so many times. And... I appreciate that after he does that, he then opens himself up to hearing what people have to say. He doesn't seem to get overly locked into the idea that it's impossible. But he would do well, I think, to recognize that pattern. Where he essentially can recognize that, like, his, his autopilot in these moments is to immediately doubt and shut down possibilities. And if you're in a position where you need to problem solve... That's not really the perspective that you want to take. It doesn't mean that he has to go along with like wackadoodle observations that people make and entertain every possibility. But to immediately shut down something that you either don't understand or makes you anxious is not akin to being invited into future problem solving conversations because that can get very annoying when people are trying to put everything on the table to figure out how to respond effectively. Uh, now, something I want to say about a VOD here that I think is really smart on his part if he's consciously doing something with this. I think... Avad realizes that he means nothing to Aloy. And I mean this in a good way. I believe that the best leaders are people who understand their audience at every given point in time and are willing to acknowledge their presence and their role and the perceptions that people might have of them relative to the context they come from. Aloy gives a little bit of decorum, like she kind of nods her head or whatever, but she immediately starts speaking with him. And Avad, no, Aaron, and a uh, blameless guy, Murad, none of them say to Aloy, you shall address our king X way. And Avad doesn't do that either. And I really see that to an extent as a respect for the fact that he's not Aloy's king. And that she doesn't have to have the kind of like symbolic love for him that maybe some of the other people in the Karja would have. And I respect that immensely. Uh, from him because I think it, it it cuts through a lot of bullshit and it gets to him being able to recognize what his sphere of influence is on trying to find Ursa 
and he immediately gets into what are the variables that he can control to make that happen. And he gets right into it instead of focusing on so much decorum, which unfortunately many leaders tend to screw around with. And I just, I really like that as like a small little piece of nuance here. Uh, it's a little odd to me, I guess, that like Avad's throne faces away from everybody. I've never really seen that before. I don't have any like meaning I'm making out of that. I just find it interesting that like his throne like looks over Meridian and people have to approach him from behind. Uh, you would think that that's kind of vulnerable as a king, but... Um, is that something somebody would even understand themselves without somebody else pointing it out? Uh, it could be, but it also may not be. So, like, with Aaron, um, yeah, like, it very well could be that he doesn't realize that he's constantly shutting things down. But, yeah, if you point that out to him, be like, like, even Aloy could do that. She'd be like, dude, Aaron, every time we start talking about something, you immediately shut it down. And I can't have that kind of energy when we're trying to figure out what to do here. So, um, for those of you that are interested in a fourth wall plus Twitch sub membership, exclamation point enter because the lovely Anonymous has gifted three of those to chat. Thank you, Anonymous. I hate to impose further after all you've done, but this is a matter of great importance to me. That's good. That's good. I, man, you know, I don't know much about this dude, okay? I don't know if he's what everybody says that he is. But I have to say that, like, his self-awareness is awesome. And his seeming respect for Aloy's presence here, that's how you invite a constituency to believe in your leadership is to show them respect instead of demanding it from them. And the way that he is handling Aloy makes it very clear that, uh, like, I now understand why he chose uh, the guy back at the outpost, I'm forgetting his name, who was like, hey, we need to respect the Nora. And he, like, he was, I was appointed as the person to interface with folks from the Nora. Like, Avad is really walking the walk on this so far, and I like that. Like, I don't want to impose any further, but I'm going to make the request. I'm going to respect your decision, hopefully, to say yes or no to this. It sounds like Ursa means a lot to you. Without her Asaram vanguard, I would not have been able to liberate Meridian and end my father's brutal reign. Since then, it has been difficult to maintain peace between our tribes. But Ursa has a way of making her people see reason. So you see, I need her back at my side. And quickly. Who is Durval, exactly? To understand Durval, you must first understand my father. He truly thought of himself as a sun god. His mind was broken. He believed that blood sacrifice would solve, well, everything. So he raided the other tribes for victims, especially the Asaram. Durval fought back. He crafted powerful weapons and rallied his people. My father responded with the ultimate cruelty. He captured Durval's wife and daughter and sacrificed them in the Sun Ring. And probably did so thinking that was his directive because of this arbitrary thing that they've created as a way to explain and perpetuate these types of behaviors. It's the scary part about this entire thing is I'll bet you that Duran would, would tell you that he was justified in all of those actions. So, why would Durval go to so much trouble to kidnap Ursa? He felt she betrayed him. She fought by his side until she realized he planned to raise Meridian and butcher its people. 
Then she came to me. Together, we stopped him and liberated the city from my father. Durval has spent every moment since trying to get revenge. Mostly on the other Asuram who fought with us. He made so many powerful enemies. <coughs> I thought we'd seen the last of him. I was wrong. I'd like to ask you something about the Sundom and its politics. By all means. They call you a sun god who killed his own father in order to unite the tribes in harmony. Is any of it true? They say you can see the invisible, split an arrow at 50 paces, and tame machines at a glance. How much of that is true? It's not too far off. Well, I would like to unite the tribes in harmony, but you saw how many courtiers I have to deal with first. Maybe next week. <laughs> Quite a place you've got here. You can almost see the little people below the mesa. You don't approve? Well, I have a secret for you. Neither do I. But we must be patient. Change won't come in a single sunrise. But will it happen at all, while men live in palaces? It might. Eventually. If people like you help me bring it about. One. I, you know, there are times where I think Aloy needs to have some tact with how she handles some stuff. But in this scenario, I actually like that she hit him with that. That's the, that's a real test of Avad's metal right there. Because if he got shitty with her, it would mean that Avad is really like all smoke and mirrors to an extent. The fact that he took that in stride and was like, yeah, I don't like it either. Uh, I don't like it either. And also is willing to acknowledge that wide systemic change does not happen overnight because he's right about that. There's a lot of folks that want to believe that you could instantly change things overnight. And the reality is you can't. Gigantic systems are cruise ships. You can't turn them on a dime. You can make individual change happen at the micro level very quickly. But changing the entire interworkings of the Sundom after they spent many years under a particular set of rules and expectations, yeah, that's going to take a lot of time. I love that Avad, in his ultimate position of leadership, is willing to acknowledge the reality not just of that but also of what the optics of his position looks like I, it's really I, I mean good for him that he can acknowledge that your politics seem very complicated the Asaram are friends but enemies too I couldn't have liberated Meridian without the help of Ursa and her Asaram freebooters many of them have settled here but the Eldermen of the Asuram clans and the claim have become jealous of their success. So have many Karja nobles. It's a volatile situation, especially given the fact that my father raided the Asuram for years. Ursa helps keep the peace, promising a future based on mutual gain. But some, like Durval, will never let go of their venom. You think Aloy's directness is a product of the fact that she was raised in seclusion by a single parent? Uh, I don't know if that would be it. I mean, she'd have to tell you that. I don't know the answer to that. Um, if I had to guess, my sense is that Aloy is willing to be direct here for probably two reasons. One... Authority figures in her own life have not exactly been good to her. Um, authority in the Nora tribe is what led to her and Rost being outcast to an extent. Uh, just the, the general structure of that perpetuated by the matriarchs is something that didn't really behoove Aloy in any kind of meaningful way. So I think there's probably some level of distaste for people in positions of authority when there are people within the system that they preside over who are struggling. 
I think the second piece of it might be that just Avad is Karja. He's the leader of the Karja. And if Aloy doesn't identify as being part of the Karja, she wouldn't identify as being one of Sun King Avad's constituents and thus doesn't see him with the level of symbolic oomph that other people in the Karja see them as. So... It really, in a lot of ways, speaks to the power of our perceptions and the symbols that we decide are more important or less important. Like, literally, the only reason Sun King Avad is the king is because he's the king. Like, because he has been arbitrarily defined as the leader because he's been appointed by the sun and because he killed his dad and he has the bloodline and all this stuff. But, like, all of that is conjured up and constructed by the humans in this environment. I mean, unless unless their doctrine is 100% true and is the way that things are, which in some ways they believe is the case. But this is when you start getting into these complicated discussions of religion and spirituality and tribalism that we've been talking about in this game, where it's like, if you have different tribes with different beliefs about why the world itself exists, and you're not unified completely under that, you have to arguably look at any of them with a degree of skepticism. Because if it's true that the sun is the thing that leads everything and is a god and dictates the terms, why is it that the Nora and the Asurum and the, the Banuk don't subscribe to that narrative? Why is it that they have their own narratives? The Karja might say, well, because they're wrong. But it's a bit odd if you're the sun and you want to have a unified force underneath you, why would you have fragmented tribes? So it gets very complicated very fast. So in that way, the symbols and the roles and the, the constructs that matter to the Karja, going so far as to saying that Avad is the sun king, doesn't matter necessarily as much to Aloy because that's not something that's been represented to her up until this point that matters. She's kind of like, all right, you're just a dude to me. Like, you're not, like, you being the Sun King, like, ooh, you get to wear a fancy hat, but that doesn't really mean anything for me. And so I think that that contributes to an extent to her ability to be so direct and casual with him. And again, I respect that Avad is taking that in stride rather than getting all his feathers all ruffled about it and taking it personally. A few things worse, in my opinion, than leaders who personalize everything, both good and bad. What can you tell me about the Shadow Karja? What do they have to do with Ursa? They are remnants of my father's regime, holding out at the fortress of Sunfall to the west. Which we would expect. So, so this is... The reason I'm pausing here is because this connects to exactly what we were talking about a little bit ago about how slow systems are to change. We have been led to believe via journal entries and the general sentiments expressed by people that we've come across that Gerard was a dick. But we have to remember what I've talked about in past episodes, which is that people that actually subscribe to the spiritual doctrine of the Karja would believe that Juran was appointed by the sun and thus is justified in his actions. And Juran was a leader for a substantial amount of time, and so the system itself starts to habituate around its leadership. So you would have, I mean, perfectly reasonable people. I mean, we call them shadow Karja right now, and we talk about them as if they're bad, but these are probably perfectly reasonable people that believed a certain thing about Jaron and believed in their doctrine and followed along and made adjustments to their own lives in order to go along with it, who then had the rug pulled out from underneath them when Avad killed Jaron. Because then Avad comes in and says, I, we're going to do shit differently. And people really don't like that. Because the Karja that followed along with Jaron and believed in what it was that he was doing and probably were propagandized into supporting him to an extent 
are now being told that the way that they orient themselves to the world and the sun and everything else is wrong. Like, your leader was actually a douche and made things worse for basically everyone. Well, people don't just automatically go, oh, oops, wow, look at me. I, I was wrong. Because to engage with a sense that you were duped into following a shitty leader is incredibly vulnerable. And a lot of people would rather just double down and say, like, no, Jaron was right. And Avad is wrong. And so I still subscribe to the tenets of, of Jaron because he's my one true sun king. And so then they fragment off and they take on their own identity relative to society and the leadership because it's too difficult to acknowledge perhaps that Jaron was problematic or maybe they benefited from Jaron being in a position of power. Maybe they hate the Nora and they love the Red Raids because it was a chance to exterminate them. I mean, we don't know. But you get these groups of people that so deeply personalize and get involved with the leadership and they have their lives affected by it, that to acknowledge that all of that was for naught is to go against a cost sunk fallacy that so many people would just rather say, you know what? No, you are all wrong. We're going to go do our own thing and have our own identity and live by the way of Jaron because that's what we believe is the way that it needs to be. And now Avad is left to say, like, do I pander to those people? Do I try to work with them? Or do I isolate them out and objectify them because the greater good is better off having them separated as a segment of society that we see as unsavory as opposed to inviting them in? It's really difficult stuff to try to create this wider systematic change. And the Shadow Karja and their existence is a perfect example of that. I realize that that's pretty long-winded, but that kind of shit's happening in real life today. So. Like him, they care only for domination and seek to draw upon the power of the sun by spilling blood in its name. Since Ursa helped me take this city from them, they were perfect scapegoats. Durval knew this, of course, and planned it well. Damn. There you go. I need to get going. I know. Well, they say kings should never beg. But please, help me find Ursa. Who says that? Well, Murad, for one. Don't hesitate to ask him or Aaron if you have further questions. All right. What kind of view you got? Oh, he can see people walking up to him. Okay, it's just kind of an interesting layout here. Ooh, let me scope out your book here, big guy. The Founding of Meridian. We are Karja. In us is the blood of those led by Araman from persecution and pursuit so long ago. Out of the far savage east we came, guardians of a treasure greater than land or metal, the leaves of the old ones. I mean, there it is. Like, you're still, they call the east savages. Like, they literally, in everything we write, they are constantly separating themselves out from the Nora by calling the Nora savages because it passively indicates that they themselves are somehow better than or more refined or whatever it is. I mean, this kind of language consistently used in these books is just such a deeply important way to establish attitudes that people have toward others. Araman found the leaves in a ruin, picked out by a beam of sunlight, and he recognized at once their importance. Within was etched the first teachings of how to observe the sun, to recognize its guidance and to understand the place of man. From out of the leaves came the first glyphs, the first writing, so our knowledge could last longer than voices. But when our forefathers offered to share this gift, they were driven out by those they had once called tribesfolk. These ones feared to have the light of knowledge brought to bear on their ignorance, or were jealous of its power. And so began the long wandering of our people, trusting only that the sun would guide them and deliver them from the barbarian tribes. The path was hard and marked by the stones of families who fell along the wayside, even Araman's own. The persecution was unceasing, 
from those without purpose, only the desire to debase and destroy. But the faith of the Karja was rewarded with a distant vision, a tower like a solid ray of the sun holding on the horizon flashing. Even as their enemies descended upon them, Aramon followed the flight of the Glint Hawks, leading his people through looming canyons and teeming jungles. Again, they saw the tower, so close now it seemed to reach to the very sun itself, and they saw that the Glint Hawks perched upon it. Behold in the light of the sun, the tower, the spire, cast its long shadow upon a mesa across the verdant valley. Aramon knew he had found a haven for the tribe, as this was a place shunned by those without his faith, who cowered from the magnificent magnificence of the spire or the shining feathers of the glint hawks. He named this place Meridian, from a passage in the leaves, and the tribe settled in the protection of the great mesa. They found the site was blessed in every respect, carving their cliff houses from the bounteous resources, and in time, from the red rock of the mesa itself, crowning it with the first columns of the city of the sun. Truly, the sun gave much to the descendants of our forefathers, granting Meridian great harvests and prosperity and the bounds of the sundom for as far as its light touched. In time, seeing Meridian shield us, shielded us from the dark arrows and plots of our foes, other foreigners brought trade and tribute. Holy Meridian! Without spire and sun, there would be no Meridian, but now and forevermore it stands as monument to both and the glory of Araman and the founders is reflected anew in each Sun King of the Radiant Line and the noble houses of the Sun Court. All right, I'll leave you to it, big guy. All right. So they want me to go all the way up basically where I had already gone, but not quite. That's all right. That's kind of nice. So is this a it's Glint Hawk, I assume. Stormbird, I guess maybe we can go get our Stormbird trophy while we do it. Let's go. Let's make the hike. Why not? And while we make that hike, I just want to say again how much I appreciate all of you being here. Whether you're watching this on YouTube, if you're watching on Twitch... I'm really grateful that you care about what I have to say. I'm grateful that you support these playthroughs. It really is awesome to play through these awesome games and talk through them with a degree of depth that they deserve. So thank you so much for <clears throat> being here and supporting what I do in whatever way you support me. will say this, I do not want to, uh, I don't, I guess I don't need to run the entire way. Let's go here. I really want to know more about the Banuke. I'm looking forward to when we hang out with them more. All right, we'll hit up that corrupted zone on our way north. Um, I know that there is DLC up in the Banuk area, but I don't know if the entire thing is, um, Regardless, we'll go we'll go hang out with them at some point. Clever. Get out of here. Not interested. <laughs> the Banuk are literally people. Don't objectify them as DLC. <laughs> Yes, yes. Please don't do that. This will help. Why actually a skill is too low? 
Just a bunch of NPCs, those Banook. Yeah. We're gonna pick some flowers along the way here. Okay, they're heading back. in the road I don't need to go that way yet let's go get this corrupted land hopefully that dude stays over there fighting each other what I'm gonna just let you guys fight each other ow ow no! Ah! Guys, I was trying to leave you alone. What is that? What is that? What? What the hell is this? What are you, a worm? Whoa! Whoa! Ah! <laughs> Holy shit! Freaking thunder jaw things. Oh my god. Oh man. Climb, Aloy. Climb. Holy crap, dude. Holy cow, man. Beatsies. Dude, the god the sound is the sound design is so good. 
Shit. My goodness. Man, those things are intense. I still need to make that bow. I keep forgetting to do that. Rock breaker. Damn. All right. Yeah, you got like no chance if you stay on the ground trying to fight those. Like you gotta go to high ground. Can't be too prepared. Search this fox. Or a fox skin? Don't need that. Okay. Uh, Banuke figurine and a flower on our way. I suppose we might as well try to grab those. Try to do stuff as we go to different areas oh man I love that their faces look like the machines used to dig tunnels yeah it's the design philosophy of this entire game is just so good All right, can we Skyrim jump our way all the way up here? Maybe. Good. Nice. Such strange artifacts. Okay. Saw a mountain, its haughty peak and bunch spine vying with the worlds on high, deflecting every salvo of the wind shouldering the starlight from the sky, brooding above the dunes like some great thinker considering days to come as nights go by. With black clouds wrapped about it for a turban and bangs of redhead lightning on its face, and through the night that tongueless mountain uttered marvelous things. Okay. I don't know that I've ever seen a mountain with a tongue, but... Of course, that Banuke figurine is way up there. Ugh, the scrapes. But because I'm a freaking baller, we're gonna go up there and get it. Let's go. All 
All right, there's the painting. I just continue to do this in the ways that are not meant to do this. Climb, Aloy. Climb. This is not the way. God damn it. Probably need to follow the paint. That would be my guess. Follow the paint. There we go. Your dedication to Skyrim climbing is certainly something, yes. I follow my own path, gorilla. Don't tell me where to climb with these ledges with white edges some kind of figurine the nuke artifact mother tuk tuk it is only because you will never read these glyphs that i can write them uh oh after a lifetime of longing i spent only a single night with ely your mother a memory that i cherished but she reviled a burning coal of guilt she carried in her belly and so I wonder, was her guilt laid bare the night Signok, our chieftain, was killed? Did he discover the truth? Was she forced to defend herself? If only I had been there to stand between them, to actually strike the blow I was punished for. At least then I would have been her champion, the father you deserved for a single moment. I paint this mark with eternal regret and leave you this offering, though it will never touch the warmth of your hands. And I just took it and I'm gonna... And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sell it to a merchant in Meridian. That's, I'm just desecrating the memory of whoever left this. Like, what is a, what is a cherished symbol of memory to you is a hot commodity to me. She's never gonna read it anyway, it's fine. <laughs> the Banuk want them back. That's why the merchant is buying them. It's fair. It's fair. <laughs> but the person who made that figurine doesn't know that. <laughs> and probably didn't expect that whenever they made it. Must everything go in a goddamn museum? Indiana Jones would say yes. Yeah. Fair. Whoa, what is this? Sawmill. People of in people of industry. All right. 
Uh, I really want to go here during the day. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up north. We're going to kill that Stormhawk. I'm going to get the trophy. And then we're going to come back during the daytime. Oh, there it is. Look at that Stormbird. Look at him chilling all the way up there. Oh, man, that's so cool. I'll tuck that away. Get it up there. Take it out. Oh, them gators. I ain't interested. I ain't buying. I ain't buying. Weird to watch somebody willingly fight a storm bird. Hell yeah, dude. Are you kidding me? <laughs> In a storm, no less. Oh, man. There it is. I see you up there. Hey! Hey! Sounds like it laughs at me when it hits me with stuff. Oh god, it's coming down! Oh lord, he's coming! Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy.
You mean your trophy. Yeah! Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Good. Good, 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 good. Let's go get this flower. And see, look at that. And dawn is upon us. That went exactly the way I wanted it to go. Oh, this big ass door up here. All right, where's that flower at? Beautiful morning. There it is. Now what were you In autumn rain the grasses rot and die. Below the steps the juming's color is fresh. Full green leaves cover the stems like feathers, and countless flowers bloom like golden coins. The cold wind moaning blows against you fiercely. Fear that soon you'll find it hard to stand. Upstairs the scholar lets down his white hair. He faces the wind. Breathes the fragrance and weeps. What are you doing out here? All right. Cool. So we got that. Now let's go down there. And see what they have to offer. Need them soon enough. That dead bird just chills there. This game is so pretty. A lot of gators chilling around here, though. I'm not fond of that. This doesn't really seem like the bayou. I got you, homie. I'm coming. Get up! You're welcome. Low and quiet dust. Oh, look at that! The stormbird's back. The last of them. Let's go gator hunting real quick. Dude, this thing is stupid powerful. Look at that. Holy shit. Get 
Good enough. Yeah, no kidding, Scar. What are y'all doing out here? Be careful. Old Aloy can't bail you out of every situation. I'm not, I can't say I'm fond of the fact that these people are polluting this beautiful area, but... Stocking up. This must be Pitchcliff. Marad's agent should be at the marketplace by now. That's so awesome! Like, look at- somebody literally rendered this out. Somebody was like, hey, make this cool-ass machine that, like, hits this metal. They didn't have to do this. But they did, and it's amazing. Wow, that's just so badass, man. There's just turkeys walking around. These guys have some cool armor. What's up, dude? No sign of Marat's guy. He's had plenty of time to investigate. We'd better look for him. Damn right. Run in a shipment of the finest Osaram wares I could find, and most Karja won't even look at it. All right. Uh, let's sell that. Yeah, so I need a I need a watcher heart in order to get these. So I'm pretty sure the Shadow Hunter bow is the one that I wanted. So I'll just have to keep my eye out for that. If we teach the people of Meridian nothing. All right. So we gotta find find this dude. What are you doing? You all right, homie? I'm thinking about the claim. Not in place, really. This guy's just got a fire arrow at the ready. Man, look at. This. So nice. This is so nice. Strike me with a hammer. But Howdy, sir. Just keeps getting gaudier. Howdy, sir. Okay. Well, I think I look good in it. So, kiss my ass. 
Uh, why? Thank you very much for the gifted sub. Fancy decoration. Appreciate that. Downright embarrassing. Fire and spit. You've got to sell your own arm to get decent materials outside the claim. You look well. In the claim, you say the gift. First, let's do a little save. operative. I'm looking. If I was Marad's operative, where would I be? I've been thinking about the claim. Not in place, really. Oh shit! Aaron, I just stepped on his face. Has to be Marat's guy. Durval's thugs must have made him. Maybe because he found something. Look at this. I think he drew a map with his own blood. Right. Those kind of maps you know you better follow. <laughs> that may be he marked a spot to the north. Could be Durval's location. And my men are waiting outside of town. I'll grab them and meet you there. You come across those maps often, Aaron? Go to the straight and then go right and then go to the X. This guy gave no good detail. Like, how many f how many miles? When do I turn right? Where is the act? This is the most shitty map ever. I mean, I'm sorry, man. Like, I, if you're going to do a map in your own death, and your own blood, man, at least give me the info I need. There's no legend. There's no nothing. I mean, I yeah, I appreciate the thought, but... Give me something. Oh, look. Going back up where we already were. All day. Or just don't die, exactly. I believe I've earned a drink. Wasn't sure about Meridian at first. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I get it. I get it. But it but you've just sent me on a on a long journey, man. Your you your death is in vain if I can't deduce what you meant from your map, you know? Like you trying to give me instructions or a riddle? I mean, I've never been, I've never been at death's door trying to write a map in my own blood. So it's hard for me to, hard for me to find empathy for that. You know, that's why I'm being so judgy right now. Like maybe just don't get ganked by an assassin and we don't have to have this conversation. Now I gotta go through Gatorville again. Imagine this being their eulogy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he was as useless in death as he was in life. A fledgling cartographer, Jimmy never really could draw maps to scale, and in his final moments, with the directive of an important mission, he drew his final map, and it also sucked. In fact, half the people that are supposed to be at this funeral 
aren't here because they were given shitty directions. And if that doesn't say something about Jimmy, I don't know what will. May he rest in peace. <laughs> the man couldn't draw a map to save his life. <laughs> What do we got here? Serious face, Aaron. Let's go. <clears throat> Machines. Looks like they've been chained up. Durval's a tinker. He probably experiments on them or, or strips them for parts. Maybe I can use them to make some trouble. I'll go in first. Hold off until the fighting starts. All right. We've got your back. Who's this guy? Who's we? When did these guys show up? All right, it's fine. I'm thinking I'm going to go bows blazing here, bud. y'all get notified. Oh, this thing's like chained down. God damn. Whoa. You alerted? You scared? What up? Oh, baby. Yeah. That's how you make an entrance, chat. That's how you do it. These people are going to be terrified of Aloy going forward.
Now, the people against the ethical treatment of robots... ...or for the ethical treatment of robots are not going to be very happy about this camp. I'd like to see any of these guys draw a map. Seems we've done what we needed to do. <laughs> Imagine living in this camp and thinking you were going to make it to the end of the day. Vaz says you gotta eat dirt. Uh. Dirt? Uh, yeah, run. Oh, yeah, there you go. That'll work. Oh, my God, it actually worked. Dude, she's right there, bro. Fine, you want to bring a gun? Fine. Fine. Ursa must be in there. Fucking we idiot. We have to get through. the hell? They must use these to protect themselves from that awful sound. These pasties will allow me to walk past. <laughs> God damn it. I thought I could say it with a straight face. <laughs> oh, oh, earphones. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's with me? These special pasties let me walk past this sonic device. Turn it off. <laughs> Aaron, quick, stick these on your nipples. <laughs> Well, he can just walk past it, but I can't. Aaron? Durval tried to break me. Shows what he knows. I, sh I should have been with you. Why didn't you come for me? I, I know I'm a useless trunk, but... No, idiot. I got a message from Durval saying he wanted to parlay. I didn't come for you because I knew it was a trap. I couldn't let you get hurt. Just didn't think it'd be that good a trap. Thought I could take him out. <laughs> no. Now listen. Durval's planning something big in Meridian. He said he'd force Avad to watch as the smoke darkens their precious sun. Your king needs you. No more playing around. You're gonna have to grow up fast. I, I will. I promise. You damn well better, little brother. 
Uh, uh, Ursa. Damn. No, no. Please. <laughs> I won't let you down. I promise. If only I hadn't gone and fought that Stormhawk. Aaron, I'm... I'm so sorry. You've got to find Durval. But Meridian's a big place. I'll... Uh, I'll look through his things. Maybe we can narrow it down. Okay, yeah, I mean, in all seriousness, um... I'm glad that Aaron got the opportunity to see his sister before she died. Like, we saw... I mean, we talked, what, three or four episodes ago now about, like, Aaron's self-loathing and his... his really self-defeating narratives and we even see it come up like the second that he grabs his sister like he immediately is like i know i'm just a worthless drunk but blah blah blah, blah. <laughs> it's a bummer in my opinion that part of aaron's last moments with his sister got hijacked by his decision to indulge that narrative rather than just be in the moment with his sister and ask her like how she's doing or what happened or whatever like Aaron can't seem to stop himself from getting in his own way on having these connective moments now that said you can see a little bit of his sister's ability to cut through that and engage with him in a meaningful way and i think in the long run aaron is going to be glad that he had the opportunity to speak with her and get some degree of interactional closure from her in the sense that like he didn't come and see her dead but i'm going to be really curious to see the way that aaron carries this on because if aaron blames himself for this and over personalizes it in a way that he seems to have been doing it could be pretty destructive for his decision making around what's to come because now he's doing this as a way to like redeem himself in her eyes but that's relative to his own projections rather than to the reality of how she saw him and he might make some rash decisions as a result of that if he's not careful it's why i'm sad for him that his projections became part of this moment because that personalization is going to carry itself forward if he's not careful with the way that she died here. And many people do this. And it's one of those things where, like, you got to be careful with the narratives you construct around these things. Because if you think that this was all your fault or that you somehow have to redeem yourself in this way, you can get very myopic in the way that you look at things. And make decisions that aren't in your best interest or the interest of the people around you that are still alive. You think that was beneficial because now maybe he won't spend all this time blaming himself. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's going to depend on how Aaron processes this. And that's that's the thing, right? Is like Aaron has a has a has a cognitive choice to make here. Do I blame myself for the fact that my sister's laying on the floor dead here? Or do I blame the circumstances and remind myself that I did the best I could and that I found her in her last moments and that was due to the effort I put in? I mean, hopefully it's the latter, but this is why I'm pointing this out, because you really can set yourself up for some rough grief if you don't take a second to really be mindful about how you process the information in the moment. And his personalization showing up with being one of the very first things he says to her is what has me, like, thinking, oh, man, like, he's... He better be careful here. It's okay if he wants to, like, you know, avenge her death or if he wants to, like, follow this directive and do what he needs to do in order to assist the world that he lives in. Like, I don't have any problem with that. And I'm glad that she gave him the directive in the way that she did. 
but he's got some real work to do here with how he processes this so that it's healthy for him going forward and doesn't lead to more destructive behaviors. Because the thing is, is if this leads to more destructive behaviors, the thing that I would imagine it could lead to is more drinking. If he takes this and says, all right, I'm done with the drinking. It's time for me to nut up and do what I really need to do here. That's great. That's a good use of this moment. But if he if he gets down on himself and starts beating the shit out of himself, he's like, you know, man, can't wait to get back to Meridian so I can get a drink and forget about all of this shit. That's not good. And yes, so Rogue, that's a really great point. This whole idea of maybe he says she didn't want to take me with her in order to protect me because I'm not capable enough of a fighter. Like, using that kind of inductive reasoning and projection on that moment is, that's the kind of stuff that can continue to build this narrative that he has about himself, that he's a worthless piece of shit. And that's just his, his my hope is that he's going to be mindful of that. If I was his therapist, that's what I'd be trying to help him focus on if he told me he wanted to learn how to work through this in a way that's going to be healthier for him than what he's been doing prior. This machine's been picked apart with precision. What's Durval learned from all his tinkering? Do I even want to know? I don't know, Aloy. Do you? Just go on without me. All right. Yeah, I'm going to just step over her real quick. I mean no offense. Ooh. Got too much already. That tear coil. Else we got in here this is a pretty cool office such a strange device it's beautifully crafted what happens when i turn it on i don't know turn it on i think i've got it working there now say something both of you doves i don't know what do you want me to say whatever you want i i just want to hear your voice and keep it for later i'll sing papa Keepsake from his family. Durval's got nothing left to lose. Durval's records, maybe. Just notes about crafting. Oh, and a letter tucked between the pages. Lots of blaze. Headed to Meridian. My loyal customer, Aelin Forgeman. I hope your plans for, for a forge in Upper Meridian are moving forward, and we're honored you chose us to provide the blaze you need. We've received payment for the third shipment, and we are most thankful for your prompt remuner... Oh man, I never can say this word right. Remuneration. Unfortunately, our hunters are struggling to cover the order. We apologize for the delay, but this is an unusually large request. As soon as we have it, we'll deliver it to your warehouse as promised. With utmost respect, Darren Huntmaster, Mainspring Machine Markings, Clan Charter 17.A.21. If we find it, I'll bet we find her vault too.
His shoes are cool. I think I cool. found something that can help. Let's head back to the palace. Go. I won't be long, but I need to tend to my sister. Do your thing, brother. Into the borderlands. All right. The sun shall fall. I feel bad for this dude's grief, but it doesn't give him the right to burn the world down, you know? Yeah. And that's why when we talk about grieving, we talk about how you can grieve however you need to, so long as you're not destructive to yourself or others. And this dude is being destructive to himself and others. Arguably others even more than himself. So it's not fabulous. You don't yet you, you hate to see that. But I'm sure we'll get more context around him as time goes on. Let's go knock this bad boy out. Give Aaron a little bit of time to tend to his sister. Man, Aloy freaks me out with all that diving into shallow water. Holy crap. Ooh, look at all these glint hawks. Uh, probably need to go, yeah, up the road a little bit. I just did to your friend. I'll do it to you too, man. Oh, my God. All right, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. this thing oh god oh god go Aloy run pancake thank you for the 25 months Tigre, what's up, man? Too much stalking. Too much stalking around. The door is bright.
about your business. What the hell? Hey! Tell me how to get in here. Looks like we're going to have to find another way in. Because that door doesn't want to open for me. T-Max, don't backseat and tell me what to do. That's a quick way to get yourself timed out. I will make it very clear when I want chat to help me. <laughs> Ask a lot of rhetorical fast. questions. I was talking to the boy. Okay. In we go. All good. That's why I give a warning. I'm a stickler about that stuff. I actually don't know if that watcher had the part I need. I didn't pay attention to whether it was blue or not. I'll have to pay attention to these watchers if they glow blue. <laughs> All right, another cauldron. Another day, another cauldron, am I right? I do like that we got this medicinal fungus all over here. Ugh, gonna have to run my boots dry. Hey, maybe I can get my trophy. That's kind of nice. What's up, man? Hey. Or is it Red Maw? At least I doubt it is. Something tells me Red Maw wouldn't be chilling in a cauldron. Though it would be kind of funny if he was. Like the reason that the hunters can't find him is because he just sits down in this like. Big machine in closed space? No, thank you. I know. I'm about to, like, take this force field off because I'm an idiot. But something that we can do to help ourselves, I think, is we can go... Cha! Cha! Dr. Mick, I'm so proud of you. You're using you're using stuff the game gives you to beat stuff. You never do that. 
You're so stubbornly annoying about the way that you play games. This force field comes down. This thunder jaw is about to find it. Shocking. Take me there. What up, big dogs? Yeah, you mad? Come toward me. Come at me. Okay, that didn't do shit. There it is. Wow, that doesn't do anything to you. Okay, but I know it does. Oh God. Okay. Oh God. Oh boy. Holy crap. Come on. Come to the other ones. Come to the other ones. Ah! Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I want you to do it. I want you to do it. Come here. Come here, big guy. No. 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 Come over here. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. That's what we needed. Come on. Ah! Ah! like trying to electrocute a person with a triple-A battery. Yeah. There we go. Information to help me override more machines. Yeah. Yeah! Zeta overrides available. Thunderjaw, Stormbird, Rockbreaker. Dude, I can override them? That's ridiculous. I go override a Thunderjaw? <laughs> yeah, dude, let's go ride a Thunderjaw around. That would be crazy, like, roll up to the Hunter's Lodge riding a Thunderjaw. What up, idiots? Alright, but we did do what we needed to do in order to, uh, at the Hunter's Lodge, so I do want to go turn that shit back in. Let's go get this campfire real quick. Dude, that might that fight must suck ma major ass on the hardest difficulty. Saving these for the trail. Like close quarters like that. Oh my goodness. What's your favorite armor and weapons in this game? 
The favorite armor is the one I'm wearing, and my favorite weapon is whichever one's going to kill whatever I need to kill. Alright, let's... Anything that I want to hit up on the way here if we walk? No. Okay. Let's go here. Can you make it so a Thunderjaw acts like a lowrider with hydraulics? Bop, 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 bop. Yeah, and you can program it to go. When you hit the horn. There's a taco truck that drives by our neighborhood in the afternoons because there's a lot of people that are doing construction in our neighborhood on like new houses and stuff. And it does La Cucaracha. It's like the way that it announces that it's there. So you hit the horn like every day at like 10 o'clock AM. I hear just over and over again. <laughs> Like the taco truck's here. <laughs> it's like the ice cream truck for adults. <laughs> yeah, the savory. <laughs> Every morning. <laughs> Have you had any of the trucks tacos? I actually haven't yet. I'm not sure if I'm like allowed. As I, I, I'm like, because there's like all the construction workers like line up and they'll they'll like get tacos and stuff. I'm like, if I'm just some like random dude that lives in the neighborhood and just walk up to the truck, I'm like, hey man, I, I I could go for a taco. I'm like in the middle of a session, like, hey, can you give me like five minutes? The taco trucks in the neighborhood. I gotta go get some tacos. Where's Talana? Maybe upstairs. Contraption to do a job that Carter could crack in a day. All right, I got a Stormbird. No assist either. Maybe Ligon knows where they are. Ligon! You have trophies. I can hang on to them until the Sunhawk returns. Where are Assis and Talana? Assis received word about Red Maw and rushed out. Talana found out a short time later and had to follow. They both went alone? Assis left without his thrush. Talana did as well. Though, I saw some outlanders follow after her. I wouldn't put it past Assis to try something underhanded to get the kill. Where have they gone? I have to help if I can. Hmm. You might be right. They've gone southeast, headed for the spear shafts. You'd better hurry. Oh, shit. That guy trying to hold on to my trophies for me. A extraordinary reward box. Wait. Oh, no. Do I not get it? Because... Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, okay, there we go. Tear Blaster. Oh my goodness, there's, oh boy. Okay. Well, uh, we might be here for a little while. Oh, this wasn't that extraordinary, dude. Enjoy these bags, good sir. <laughs> the Terror Blaster. What is the, the Terror Blaster? The blasts of compressed air from this close range weapon strip armor and components from machines without the need to aim precisely, leaving them more vulnerable to follow up attacks. Ooh. 
Well, that's cool. Don't. Okay. Oh, what's going on down there? Ooh, do we try to go get Red Maw? Do we make that hike? We take that hike? Oh yeah, let's give these guys their stuff. Forgot about these guys. Where are you at? Where's the arguing? They're easy to find if you just look for the arguing. Come take a look. There you are. What's up, boys? I have both of your parts. I brought you both the parts. So, what do you say? I don't suppose I could buy just the one. You'd buy the wrong one. So give the hunter her shards for both. Of course, of course. Here you are. If this is the price I have to pay. The price you have to pay? The snap maw lens might just cover the loss we take on the other. It won't sell for a loss, charcoal burner. You'd pay handsomely for a long leg lens if you had an imagination. I have an imagination. When you rattle that piece of junk around, I think of your skull. I told you from the beginning this wouldn't be a scrap dealing operation, well, that we would have class. And I told you a true metal seller knows to get his hands dirty. <laughs> As you wipe machine oil on my silks. Who wears a silk apron to the <laughs> metal market? <laughs> Don't forget to stop I do. You're on the road. You'll like what I have for sale. I like them. <laughs> All I do. Goods here. See for yourself. I've got all the best. All right. Here's here. You get to watch your heart along the way. We're gonna get ourselves a nice bow. Man, so, what a god! What a cool city. Careful, Aloy. Watch where you're running. I don't care if you think it's superstition. Red Maw has crushed all who hunted it. That's All right. Campfire discovered this corrupted zone. I guess we might as well go hit that up. While I'm here. Save these for the trip. Don't tell me that, gummy bear. That's back seating and spoilery. Chat, please refrain from telling me about anything I don't directly ask about. I know it can be kind of annoying and nitpicky, but it hurts my enjoyment of the game and my ability to analyze it properly when you guys give me information that I don't ask for. An easy rule to follow. That's got their attention. gun off afterwards. Damn it. Boom, what 
a shot. Um, ethereal, it's my pleasure, friend. I'm glad it was meaningful. Yeah, enjoy that fire. That's good. Ooh, all right, so there's another vantage point. I would like to hit that up on our way down there. So we're gonna go directly south. Excalibur, thank you for the raid. Welcome in. Uh, folks that are coming along with the raid, if you don't know who I am, I'm Dr. Mick. I'm a licensed couple and family therapist. I have a PhD in human development. This is Game Sessions with a Therapist, where we play cool games, talk about mental health, psychology, therapy, and more. An effort to destigmatize those things and bring information to people who wouldn't otherwise have it in a responsible and ethical way. This is a blind, spoiler-free playthrough of Horizon Zero Dawn, so I ask that you please not post any spoilers or backseating in chat, as that will get you banned or timed out. Um, but uh, I play games, and I use them to illustrate psychological concepts and help people learn about stuff in a more tangible way. So if that sounds cool to you, make sure you check out my YouTube channel and stuff, because I've played a lot of popular games Red Dead Redemption 2, Cyberpunk, Grand Theft Auto 5, Last of Us 1 and 2, all sorts of good stuff. But thank you very much for bringing your community over here, Excalibur. I appreciate it. I hope you had a great stream. I do not, Adet. I do not enjoy those games. Oh shit! This must be Sunstone Rock. It's being attacked by machines. Oh, I what is I got that? Chances. You want to tell Warden Geneva we back down? Let's take our chances. I don't recall ever fighting one of those. Alright. Go get this other one.
Come on. There we go. Woo! You pulled us out of a tough spot, Outlander. Welcome to Sunstone Rock. You should speak to Warden Geneva inside. Okay. Did I have a mission here? I don't even remember if I had a mission here. This place is creepy looking. Uh, I'm gonna go get that vantage point first. Before I go in there. I'm gonna let these people settle down a little bit. I'm gonna let the adrenaline wear off. Vantage point, I'm guessing, is up there. Let's find our ledges. Yeah, oh! I love the dramatic slow-mo there. Yeah. Wait, really? All that just to... Oh, okay. All right, I love reading these. A pocket shit storm tore day seven. I was three months out of rehab when we went camping out here. Wyatt went to sleep early. So it was just the two of us when we stayed up and watched the Perseids. After, so we talked about the stars and space tech. I suddenly knew what I wanted to do with my life. Oh, yeah, is that right? Well, let's read or let's find out more about it. Hi, Ma. It was August. Summer school had wrapped and I'd aced my courses. So I was headed back to 10th grade with a good head of steam. As a reward for my studies and my sobriety, you and Wyatt gave me a Fullerton Labs Astro Prodigy and took me camping to watch the Perseids at their peak. I was so amped. Wyatt spent all afternoon struggling with a self-constructing shelter he'd bought for the trip until finally he gave up and built the damn thing manually. Well, the sleeping pods anyway, while we made a fire and cooked dinner. It must have taken a lot out of him because Wyatt was nodding off at dinner and went to bed soon after. As night fell, we sat and watched the meteors streak across the sky like fingernail scratches, marveling at their abundance, laughing our delight. After an hour or so, you asked me to teach you the constellations, so I launched the Astro Prodigy and played Professor, spouting off about each star group as the drone magnified them. Later, I had it zoom in on the Odyssey which was still being constructed in order to back in order in orbit back then. It was another year or two before they abandoned it. We could actually see the robots building it, zipping across the hall like little fireflies. So I jabbered about that, which got me started on yammering about the robots that Pharaoh and other corporations, even Metallurgic, had begun sending up to mine helium-3 from Luna and metals from the asteroid belt. The more I spoke about space tech, the more excited I became. But I was getting cold, too. Deserts at night are like that. So I sat back down next to you and we huddled under the camp blanket. For a little while, we were quiet. I wanted to say what I was thinking, but it felt ridiculous. But then Wyatt snored explosively from inside the shelter and we giggled. And our laughter seemed to make an opening for me to just go ahead and say it. That I, 
your delinquent son, who'd almost flunked out of high school, who'd nearly died of an OD at a, back, at a bash core concert, wanted to be an aerospace engineer and make the sorts of machines we'd been talking about. Robots to gather resources in the solar system. Maybe even ones that could travel to other stars and colonize new worlds. You looked at me and smiled. Then that's what you'll do. And then you looked up at the night sky and said, very plainly, as though it was a simple fact, you will write the story of our family across the stars. School started the next week, and I never looked back. Whoa! Look at that! All right. Well, let's go see what the deal was. Let's do a little. Oh! Oh! That's one way to drop down. All these freaking medicinal herbs I've been collecting, and I do that to waste them. All right, whatever. All right, let's go up here. Go up here and see what they got for me over here. Yeah, I hope there's a lot of calcium because I really need some bone density for all the fa all the falling down I've been doing. There's probably some lore in here, I would have to imagine. In here. It was a machine lure. We don't know how they got it. Rosgrun concealed the parts on his person, no doubt. We searched him. How? You don't want to know how. Hardest settlement here. What's up? Warden Geneva. This is the one who defeated the behemoths. Outlander. I'm impressed. I don't impress easily. Tell me, how do you fare with hunting living prey? Haven't had any complaints. Why? Three dangerous prisoners have escaped. I need my men here, getting the others back in line. None of this would have happened if we dealt with criminals the old way. But I've clashed that gong before, and here I am. And here you are. I'm just gonna tell you right now, lady, I'm not really into the for-profit prison system, so being a cog in your machine doesn't feel great. What's the old way? To be buried up to the neck and left for the sun's judgment. Seems to me like the judgment's already been made. Not one of them committed another crime. Who are these dangerous prisoners? Three from the isolation cages. Don't feel sorry for them. They've lived well off the Sun King's conscience. First is Rosgrund. Osram trap maker, hates the Karja, crazy as a loon in heat. Caught in one too many blasts, or one too few. Then there's Ulia, a Tanakh warrior, if that means anything to you. Not really. Another tribe? Reavers, from the south, bloodthirsty. Some say they're cannibals, but she slurped gruel well enough. And the last is Gavon, a traitor who smuggled weapons to the exiles. Compared to the other two, this one doesn't seem so bad. He helped drag out a civil war, all for the shards it got him. A machine has more warmth. So the Karja keep their criminals in this place? Since the liberation. We've had them all, from thieves to the Mad King Jaron's former Kestrels. The Sun King believes in the power of change. And sure enough, some did change. Shed their skin, like lizards. I thought all criminals were the same once. That's why the Sun King gave me command of Sunstone Rock. As an education. Sounds like an honor. I mean, I haven't seen any other women in Karja armor. No. I'm not one of your sisters. No woman can wear Karja armor. When I was young, I chose to become a soldier. One good enough to join Avad's honor guard. There was talk about what I was. So I'd say... Test me, and I'll break your arm. After enough arms had been broken, there was less talk. I'm curious. 
But I'd rather we didn't have to start fighting. Agreed. Let's get down to business! So you want these prisoners brought back? No. I want them put in the earth. I doubt they'll give you any choice. They had their chance with the Sun King's generosity. So now they face mine. A bounty on all their heads. Ulia of the Tanakh, Razgrund of the Asaram, and the traitor Gavon. If I did this for you, I'd need a lead on them. Well, when Ulia first swept through the Sundom, it was with the jungle bandits. I say she'll go back. Razgrund we pulled out of a crack in Dusk Mesa, where he'd been tinkering with his bombs. And Gavon will be trying to pay his way across the lake. I'd burn my palm on it. Look in Bright Market. So, um... People have different philosophies on hand, how you handle criminal behavior, and I'm not here to really go too deep into that, but I do want to highlight something that happens in the way that we talk about this that is very similar to how we've handled other issues in the game with objectification. Uh, some people believe that uh, criminals are to be locked away to basically be made as an example to other people so that they live in fear of what will happen to them if they commit crimes. So some people view this stuff as being a deterrent. Other people view this as rehabilitation, like maybe people had certain circumstances that led to why they did what they did, and maybe they just need uh, a better piece of representation to make better decisions going forward. Ultimately, the thing that I think is most sad about how we handle this, regardless of which philosophy you have, is that there is a tendency to objectify criminals. And I'm sure there are some people sitting here going, that's what they deserve! But, man, I tell you, like, if you, if you take that kind of short-sighted approach to how you view other humans, you're really going to have a lot of problems if you want to connect with the people around you in the general greater society you're in. Like, every single one of those criminals has a story. Are there people that are dangerous and should be kept away from others because of the harm that they choose to cause? 100%. But when we do this blanket generalization, criminals, it's a form of objectification that leads to the allowance of environments that criminals are kept in that are not particularly great. And we, in some ways, will treat criminals as cattle or commodities in the case of the United States. Um, objectification is a great way to stop people from empathizing. And when you stop empathizing, you start to treat people as objects. And that then can lead to certain behaviors that we might say are not particularly humane. For example... This person saying we bury them up to their necks and then let the sun decide what to do. That is abhorrent behavior, regardless of who it is that you're doing it to. Like at some point when you inflict punishment on objects, it becomes more about you and whatever catharsis you experience by doing that as opposed to actually handling the issue at hand. And I, I, I all roads lead back to the way we use language in order to guide people's behavior on these types of things. Calling these people criminals and adhering to that label and objectification is really no different than when the Karja call the Nora savages. Or when the Nora call people like outcasts or whatever. Like we have these labels we use in order to separate ourselves from empathizing or connecting with people that we might struggle to connect with. And you might ask yourself as I'm saying this, well, why would you do that? Something that I think is very hard for many people to understand is that the capacity for the criminal behavior that many of the people that are in this prison are capable of or, or engaged in is something that all of us could do, ostensibly. Like, you could 
find yourself in that kind of position. And to empathize with criminals means to have to access the part of you that's capable of doing that. And many people don't like the idea of being, no, I would never steal. Well, because you live in certain circumstances where stealing is something that you can see as abhorrent behavior because maybe you don't need food or you don't need resources because you can generally live your life the way you want to or whatever. But the idea that you could turn to that as an option for how you navigate your world is something a lot of people don't want to recognize. They don't want to see the wholeness of the human experience. So the way that we save face in our own minds sometimes is to objectify people who we perceive as doing things that we consider to be unsavory or are against our value set. So just a little bit of like an additional context around like how these types of things are perpetuated and the importance of language in how we categorize not just things, but like other humans. Right, we're like, now we're essentially biased to see these three people that we're chasing after as these like fugitives that don't deserve any kind of mercy or benefit of the doubt or whatever. And like in some cases, yeah, like if they're dangerous enough and they show a propensity, like I'm not anti-incarceration, but the hope would be that you would work to try to reform folks to a point where they could participate in a meaningful way in society, especially if their circumstances contribute to the reason they're incarcerated, like essentially making sense. I think all of us would like that kind of empathy extended our way if we were in that position. At least I know I would. You're in my life. I must meet the sun's gaze for it to blister away my sins. When will they let us go back to tending the garden? No, oh boy. This is. I saw Black Eyed Gavan and I had something going. No, it's just a shadow. How's life on the other side of the bars? Savage. <laughs> So there are Osaram and Asundam now. I get up, I work. All right, buddy. There are no shadows under the noonday sun. Words to live by. I don't really know how to live by those words, but whatever you say, big hoss. All right, let's go get this flower. All right. I know this is a bit of a longer episode, so if you're still hanging in there, whether you're on YouTube or here on Twitch, thank you for hanging in there with me and sticking around for it. I appreciate it very much. We've made some good headway on this episode. I could do without so many stalker areas, man. Stop. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Whatever, belly. Ooh, wait, they got like blue shit in there. Breeze bellow back. Oh. Uh, scrabbling a bit. Howdy ho! Oh boy, there are a lot of you here.
Nice. Made quick work of those, huh? All right, flower, where are you? There you are. <clears throat> Life, believe, is not a dream, so dark as sages say. Oft a little morning rain foretells a pleasant day. Sometimes there are clouds of gloom, but these are transient all. If the shower will make the roses bloom, oh, why lament its fall? I like that one. I like that one. Now. Another cauldron. Jeez, we're like right there. Cauldron 11. What are they doing here? Whoa, whoa, hey, ho, oh, oh. ho. All right, your girl ain't got time for that right now. I just want to get this campfire. And I want to go out over here. To Lana, Lana, I have no quarrel with you. Just keep doing your thing. Shit, where are you? There are particular personality types that like to read all the in-game dialogue. First thing you need to understand is that personality types are not a thing. Uh, so no. Uh, really, it just comes down to if people are interested in reading the uh, in reading the dialogue or not. If that's a part of their enjoyment of the experience, that's really the only marker. We would not chalk something like that up to a personality type. Way too much boxing in of the human experience when we go in that direction. Oh, I see him out there. I see him out there. Oh, baby. We're going to see what they're up to in part 14. Friends, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this episode. I appreciate it immensely that you support these streams in the way that you do. Um, make sure you leave a like, make sure you leave a comment, follow the links down in the description. If you're binging, we'll see you in the next one. If you're waiting for the next one to come out, we'll get it out as soon as we can. 
I appreciate you all immensely. Thank you for being awesome and engaging with my content. Catch you on the next one.